This discussion will complete our overview of the evolution of melanism. And we're going to look across a wide group of organisms, but we're going to begin with this example that we set up in the last discussion of the, of the melanic forms of uh, leopards. Okay, now, there are two different types of melanin, um, and there are multiple genes that are involved in the production of this pigment. One of the critical ones, and one that we see it popping up over and over again, is called MC1R. So you need to know that gene. We're going to look at it here and look at uh, in some detail across different groups of organisms. Okay, So it's, it's much more complicated than just one gene, but this is one of the big ones. And so there's been a lot of work on it. We have a pretty good detailed understanding of many of the melanic forms, and basically this gene, when there is a mutation to it, causes pigment to build up. So rather than being processed and moved out of the cells, it builds up and builds up if there is a mutant version of this gene. So it's a nice, easy loss of function mutation that can lead to darker pigmentation. Okay. Now, in coats where there are patterns, there, there are different regulatory elements that control this gene across different regions, parts of the skin. Uh, but we're going to look at what happens when the gene just is not functional at all, and how does that result in a darker coat. Okay, so the pattern is an interesting question. We'll, we'll kind of touch on that a little bit with a fruit fly model later, but really we're just kind of looking at a very simple beginning. If we mutate this one gene, we know we're going to get a darker form. Okay, so they've done work in the Jaguar, and they know that there is a mutant version of the MC1R gene. So then they said, hey, let's take a look at the Jaguar Rundi. And sure enough, when they found the Jaguar Rundi, they found that they had a version of this gene that was not no longer uh, functional, or at least not in the same way. So it can do some other things, but it, it has this mutation that causes the buildup of pigment. And we look at that and say, well, that's a, a, a bad thing if we take a gene and make it so it no longer does something that it should be doing. But realize it's just like any other mutation. So it might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing. If you're living in an area where a dark coat, or maybe you're not uh, partially nocturnal and that dark coat provides some uh, camouflage for you while you're hunting your prey or while you're trying to stay uh, unseen, it might be a, a great benefit. Now, the next question is, okay, that's in cats, but let's extend this to other organisms. And this is a cool one because there are hundreds upon hundreds of examples of melanic versus kind of more standard wild type form. So there's some really interesting convergence in different groups of pocket gophers. These are rodents that can live in light substrate or dark substrate, and you see some pretty dramatic variation. And there are lots of other rodents that show these melanic versus non-melanic forms also. And so they looked at this, and sure enough, they found in the same gene there were some amino acid replacements. That means a mutation that actually changed an amino acid in this MC1R gene. So our first example is not about gene regulation. It's about changes to the genes themselves. And we can think of these as alleles, right? Because that's all an allele is, is originally it's a mutant version of a previous gene. And if it's beneficial or essentially neutral, then we, we may keep it and we'll end up with more genetic diversity. Now we can, and we'll, we'll look at, at, at how we would look for and distinguish whether it was gene regulation or whether it was a change to the gene itself. But we can also find examples in a species where we do have changes in regulation that also result in differences in uh, the population. And so this one has been under positive selection. We can see it fairly clearly. If there's an advantage, if you're living on a dark substrate, or if you're nocturnal and a dark coat helps you to blend in better, then there will be positive selection for this. And we see over and over and over again with slightly different variations, but the dark coat can be beneficial in many different circumstances. Okay. Now, oh, I missed soap. Book. <laughs> you know what? I think earlier these were jaguars that we were looking at. Anyway, so in the jaguar, it's the MC1R gene, and the jaguar undie, it's the MC1R gene. Here is a leopard. Now, I, I'm not, a, not a, a cat person, but I should have remembered. I learned this a long time ago. The way you can tell jaguars from leopards 
is jaguars typically have these rings with spots in between where leopards just have clusters of spots. And as I mentioned earlier, there are melanic forms of leopards and jaguars. So in the leopards, there is no connection with the MC1R gene. It's a completely different gene. So that's a great example, and it brings up an important point. Things that we maybe know are convergence, we can gather additional data at the genetic level to support that supposition of convergence. So if we assume, though, look, there are spotted leopards and there are spotted jaguars, but then there are a few melanic forms, if we assume that happened independently and maybe not in a common ancestor, we don't have a lot of evidence. But if we look and say, oh, here's the exact mutation in the jaguar, here's a different mutation in the leopard, we know for sure then that those are convergent mutations because they're different changes, okay? So another tool, a little bit of a finer um, scope that we can look at to determine whether the, something is convergence or not because we can look at the actual change in the DNA rather than just the resulting phenotype, okay? And there are melanic forms all over the place. There are lots and lots of cool examples. Um, there is a uh, example in bears where it's kind of a reverse form where there are non-melanic forms of black bears in certain areas. They're uh, called spirit bears and, and played an important role in, in culture of the Native Americans that lived in that area. And it turns out that the white morphs of the bears are the result of a different mutation in MC1R gene, so it's more active and it just gets rid of all of the pigment. So not only that, but this exact same gene is what also causes coat color in many of our domestic breeds of dogs. So let's take a look at the genetic level of some of these changes and actually map them onto a region of this gene. So the MC1R gene is a membrane gene. It has a transmembrane domain here, these three layers. Every circle is a very diagrammatic representation of an amino acid. And then it has the extracellular portion and the intracellular portion. Now, we're only looking at this one area here with this black circle for all of these changes. And it turns out that there are two areas that can be changed and have an impact on um, the uh, outcome of the phenotype. So interestingly enough, the ones that tend to decrease color are here on the terminal end, the, um, not the amino end, but uh, the other end of the uh, amino acid. Um, and so notice that that gives us the white bear, that gives us yellow labs, like lighter labs instead of the dark ones, Irish, Shedder, Golden, these light yellow and golden colored dogs have mutations in that area, which changes that pigmentation. But loss of function so that we have pigmentation building up is usually in this transmembrane domain where we have these three kind of back and forth, back and forth areas that, that go across uh, the lipid membrane. Now, the mutation of the mouse is uh, here in uh, blue. The mutation that makes dark cows and dark pigs is in a similar region. But notice that even though the regions are somewhat similar, the mutations themselves are different. I'm sorry, the blue circle is the jaguar rundi. I think the mouse is in this, this kind of tan color. So a mutation right there is what gives jaguar rundis their dark color, where a mutation in a related but different area, right? So there is some overlap, but a very different mutation gives us the melanic form of the jaguar. So definitely convergence. We kind of knew that ahead of time because they're not real closely related but now we have a genetic piece of evidence data supporting that convergence. So back to our original four questions. Is it the same genes? Yep, it is. Are they at the same levels? Well, no, not really, but they're in similar areas, so we can certainly see some patterns, right? We're not seeing mutations to the transmembrane domains over here or this extracellular loop. So there are definitely some functional uh, hints about how this gene works based on where these mutations are that confer melanism. And of course now, yep, we know it's convergence. We have even better evidence. We mapped it onto a phylogeny, but now we have an additional bit of location, genetic location, to support and increase that convergence, right? And so we know exactly, that should be number four. I don't know why I have two threes. That's gonna bother me. Let me change that one. Um, okay. Uh, so number four is what's the genetic mechanism? Well, it's not regulation, right? It's a change to the amino acids themselves, right? So 
this is a really cool example of a one system where we can look at many, many examples, and there's still a lot of work that's being done uh, in vertebrates, uh, but also even in invertebrates who also have an MC1R gene, and it plays a role in pigmentation and color of the exoskeleton. And so not only does this give us our melanic form, but it also gives us our patterns. Here's the leopard, right? So notice rings of spots, little clusters of spots, but no spots in the middle. So if, if you're ever in the wild and you need to tell a leopard from a jaguar, probably the easiest thing to do is, well, are you in South America, Central America? Then it's a jaguar. Or are you in Africa or Asia then it's, or Middle East? Then it's a leopard. But anyway, that's a, a handy little thing. And so stripes in zebras, spots in cats, these speckled patterns in giraffes all result from differential control of the same gene. So if we can turn it on, if we have a functional gene, but we can turn it on and turn it off in different areas, then we can get these really cool patterns. And after the last lecture, I had to double check, make sure I was right, and I Googled an image of a shaved tiger. Um, so this is a tiger. I don't know if they were shaving it for an operation or something like that. And sure enough, they have stripes in the skin. So for all of these, um, it's going to be not just the fur that's, that's spotted, but the, um, the skin underneath it also, okay? And so we have these very interesting but different patterns that can result. And I even recently saw something that was very cool, I thought. Um, uh, a zebra baby was spotted recently with spots. They're kind of in, in the same uh, general area as the stripes, but spots instead of um, uh, stripes. And it's kind of this question, are zebras uh, white horses with black stripes or black horses with white stripes? And if we look at this, it looks like actually the underlying pattern is black, right? With those white spots. And so it might be a fairly simple mutation that could change a stripe pattern to a spot pattern or vice versa. So little different patterns early on in, in how we define different regions of the developing epidermis could result in very different patterns. And some of these are now mapped to cis regulatory regions. So our example of overall melanism was a change to the gene itself. But changes to the patterning of melanism is more about regulation and not changes to the gene themselves. And that's how we can have differential impact in different areas. And there's a nice analog in Drosophila. And in Drosophila, because it's a model organism and, and there are less um, logistical and ethical considerations when we're working with it, we can do some much more detailed and functional studies when we're working with Drosophila. And so there's some nice work done. It's a different gene for this example, but it's some really interesting um, uh, patterns where we can see uh, the Drosophila melanogaster, a wild uh, close cousin that is dark and then one that's just kind of very intermediately pigmented. And not only that, but they can look at Drosophila, which only has pigment in the posterior part of the, of the abdominal segments. And we can look at expression of these target genes. And so the gene is the same in all three of these species, but the regulatory region that controls where it's gonna be turned on has evolved and is different, thus giving us these different patterns that are adaptive and beneficial for these different species. So the gene that controls this patterning is BAB. I forget what the, I think it's bric-a-brac. I think that's the um, uh, full name, but BAB, I'll put both on, on an exam if I ask you about it. But different gene, but very similar patterns. So BAB represses, uh, wherever it's, it's expressed, represses pigmentation. And so by having different areas that have repression of this gene, we can end up with very different patterns. And it's a very flexible and dynamic system that's evolved quite a bit across the different Drosophila species. So though it's not the same gene and the same pathway for pigmentation, it's a similar one. And we can look at it as an example of the corollary for the pigmentation patterns that we're seeing in vertebrates, where of course doing the work with the vertebrates is much more harder uh, and logistically and ethically there are a lot more things that need to be taken into account to do those sorts of experiments. Okay, So although we may not be able to do the same things, we have some nice uh, results and some corollaries in model organisms. So simple developmental characters like pigmentation can be modified by a variety of developmental mechanisms. We see changes to the gene itself, 
We also see changes to uh, the gene regulation. And really the, the, the kind of take home message is that evolution is the same at all levels. It's just a matter of time and scale. Now, to some extent, we may see a little bit more changes to the genes themselves within a population because populations are kind of like the laboratory or the experiment system where new genes are introduced, new alleles. If it works, it's kept, and those are, are there. But many of the major changes that make differences and not these kind of just minor changes within a species are regulation changes. So we see in the species level changes to the regulation and changes to the genes themselves and perhaps a little bit more uh, emphasis on changes to the genes and the species, but we still see those same patterns. And over large time scales, those result in the differences between jaguaras and jaguarundis, um, all of them, not just the melanism, but all of these changes. And so we're in the process of beginning to map those out and figure out all of the changes that um, cause uh, diversity in life on Earth. And so knowing this, we can now kind of reassess our ideas about homology. So originally, we might not know, if we had a phylogeny, we'd have a, a pretty good idea. But we may not know whether this coloration is homologous or not. And in fact, once we say, hey, look, it's the same gene, if you didn't know the exact mutation, you'd say, oh, maybe it is homologous. It's the same gene that gives this dark color in both of these uh, species. But then when we look at the gene itself, we have a much finer tool and say, oh, it's not homologous. Same end result, same gene, but a different, slightly different, same general area, but a different mutation in the gene resulted in these two very similar phenotypes, okay? So here's just an animation to, to kind of illustrate that. So in red, that's the mutation there uh, that causes the jaguarundi. That's the mutation there for um, uh, the jaguar, and we have this area where it overlaps, but very different mutations lead to that. So we can assess, uh, assess these at a very fine genetic level. And for some systems, we can even then look at the underlying genetic, genetic, uh, genetic networks, and we can create model systems that might mimic something that we can do in lab. And this is very similar to the way that we use model organisms in non-developmental questions also. So there are pigmentation models that can be used in Drosophila.